our God saves sinners for our good and his glory. And from the beginning, he's been using broken people like us to tell his story. From creation to cross, from death to resurrection, his heart was always set on people from every class and every station. But before he heads out and leaves their sight, before he ascends to heaven before their very eyes, the king tells his people that they have a mission while he's gone. They are now witnesses of his kingdom and they'll never have to do it alone because he'll be with them in spirit until he returns to take them home and redeem his creation. In his kingdom, he wants to have representation from every nation. So until he returns, may the gospel be the joyful proclamation of every church congregation to Americans and Haitians, Africans and Asians, letting the globe know that through Christ, God has orchestrated our salvation. And as we do so, his return, we hasten. So church, the goal is not to be his kingdom ambassador solely out of obligation, but that we'd give our lives to proclaiming his salvation with childlike elation until he returns or calls us home. Because God saves sinners for our good and his glory. And our prayer is that as his people, we get caught up in his story. Somewhere around 2,000 years ago, a little boy was born to a young woman and her fiancé. They are lower class from a small, nowhere town. This boy grows up. He participates in the family business in this Israeli town called Nazareth. Nazareth is a sort of place where when people hear it's where you're from, they say things like, can anything good come from Nazareth? So he grows up. Around the age of 30, he leaves the family business to walk around and teach the Hebrew scriptures, what you and I now call the Old Testament. Apparently, he was very good at it. Over time, he drew quite a crowd when he would show up to, in a town to speak. And the things that he said were so compelling, things like that he came to bring about the forgiveness of sin and the way that he would treat and teach that those marginalized in society, the prostitutes and tax collectors and the like, that they were equal and valuable and loved in the sight of God as everyone else, these types of things. Some people began to believe he was the long-awaited Messiah, the one who was supposed to reestablish the kingdom of Israel and overthrow their oppressors. The problem was, some of the things that this man said and did very much offended the religious and political establishments of the day. Those two groups rarely, if ever, agreed on anything, but over time they began to agree that this Jesus from Nazareth was a legitimate threat. So they conspired to have him dealt with. They had him executed through a method unique to the Roman Empire. It was called crucifixion. It was such a, a disturbing and embarrassing way to die that Roman citizens in polite society actually refused to even speak of it. They considered it shameful to even talk about or acknowledge its existence. So even though thousands and thousands of people were crucified during Rome's reign, there are actually very few mentions of crucifixions in any documents or writings of the time. So Jesus of Nazareth was crucified, he died. Those who'd been following him around, learning from him, believing that he was in fact Israel's deliverer, they all scattered. Some of them went back to their previous places of employment. Because to them, Jesus' death proved to everyone that he, in fact, was not the promised Messiah. Because the Messiah was supposed to leave the na lead the nation to prosperity, and obviously that's not what happened. So they were confused and sad and disappointed, probably a little bit embarrassed that they'd got caught up in the hype and had been deceived. So whatever they thought was going to happen fizzled out to what seemed like nothing. So I want you to think of all of that as point one on the timeline. The life, death of Jesus, point one. Here's point two. This morning, you woke up and you checked for the time and it was 6 a.m. January 9th, 2022 A.D. A.D. stands for Anno Domini. That's Latin for in the year of our Lord. That's in contrast with B.C., which stands for before Christ. You probably didn't think much about it, but your clock and calendar are based on the life of this man who was publicly, shamefully executed with all of his followers leaving and scattering into the night. Then you check the news. 
Maybe you heard about a, a human rights violation taking place in our world, and you, inf- you just instinctively thought to yourself, that is not okay. Human beings have rights, and it is unjust for a person's rights to be violated. And you probably didn't realize it, but that instinctive belief has not at all been instinctive to the vast majority of human beings in history. It's a byproduct of the teachings of the man who was killed hanging naked on a cross by the Roman government. The idea that individual humans have rights didn't come from ancient Rome or Greece or any other ancient thought leaders. And you walked out of your house as a citizen of a nation called the United States of America. It's a democratic republic that was founded as an experiment to see what would happen if we put into play some core ideas, like we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And you should know that what was self-evident to Thomas Jefferson is anything but self-evident to those who find themselves outside of the long stream of thought emanating from Jesus of Nazareth. In fact, apart from a creator God endowing equality, human beings are anything but equal. We aren't equally productive or successful. We aren't equally intelligent or competent. We aren't equally attractive or talented. And in fact, practically speaking, there are very few things in which we're equal. The only possible way to think that it's self-evident that human beings are equal is to be steeped in the ideas flowing down from a lower-class Middle Eastern man from a nowhere town. And then you arrived here in an old warehouse in downtown Columbia, a former nightclub, which used to host such classy events as Twerk Thursday. (laughs) If you're new, that's actually not a joke. That is a real thing. There were cards, there were like flyers. When we bought the building, we walked in and there were flyers for Twerk Thursday that were on the floor. (laughs) You're here gathered with hundreds of others, some of them similar to you, some quite different from you. One thing in common, you're here to worship this Jesus of Nazareth. And you this morning join with billions, with a B, of other people all across planet Earth and believing that this Jesus is Lord of heaven and earth the Son of God who's come to save us from our sins and will one day restore the earth. That's point two on the timeline. And if you're thoughtful at all, the question is, how in the world could these two points exist on the same timeline? How is it possible? How could we have gone from point one to point two? There's not a person in the world who was present for point one that could have imagined that point two would have existed in that moment. In fact, during the moments of point one, to have suggested that point two would exist would have sounded so ridiculous, no one would have even listened to you. How do both points one and point two exist? How could such a small, hopeless endeavor by a Middle Eastern impoverished traveling teacher become a history-altering, globe-sweeping movement? Well, that is what the book of Acts is all about. It's about the beginning of a movement that would go on to sweep the planet to such an extent that thousands of years later, some of its teachings could be called self-evident. To such an extent that billions of people are caught up in it. And to the extent that you find yourself here on a Sunday singing songs about it with people who otherwise would be strangers. So in the opening lines of his book on Acts, theologian Michael Green puts it this way. He says, quote, Three crucial decades in world history. That's all it took. In the years between AD 33 and 64, a new movement was born. And in those 30 years, it got sufficient growth and credibility to become the largest religion the world has ever seen and to change the lives of hundreds of millions of people. It has spread into every corner of the globe, has more than 2 billion putative adherents, It's had an indelible impact on civilization, on culture, on education, on medicine, on freedom, and on course, and of course, on the lives of of countless people worldwide. And the seedbed for all of this, the time when it took decisive root, was in these three decades. It all began with a dozen men and a handful of women, and then the Spirit came. 
The book of Acts is actually the only account we have immediately following the life of Jesus that show how point one and point two could possibly coexist on the same timeline. So for the next few months, we're going to dive in to see the life and testimony of these early followers of Jesus to see what happened and then what it means for us now. So let's get started. Acts chapter one, we'll pick it up in verse one. Also, putative is a word I'd like to start incorporating. (laughs) I don't exactly know how. I'll have to do some research, but expect more putatives from me. So today we will keep it at an introductory level, and we'll look at Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 14, and we'll we'll just work through the passage and read some and talk some. Okay, Acts chapter 1, verse 1. In the first book, so real quick, Acts is written by Luke, who is a follower of Jesus and a traveling companion of the Apostle Paul. When he says in the first book, he means the book of Luke, the gospel of Luke. So in the first book, O Theophilus, both Luke and Acts are addressed to someone named Theophilus, who was apparently an early follower of Jesus as well. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. So Luke says that Jesus presented himself alive after his crucifixion, over a stretch of 40 days. We, are, we learn in other places in the Bible that at times he ate with them, they touched him, they examined his scars from his crucifixion. And in our First Corinthians, we learned that he appeared to hundreds of people actually alive after his death. So I just want to point all that out because I know sometimes people today, we like to think of ourselves as very smart and we're very enlightened, And sometimes people can read things like this, for example, the claim that Jesus rose from the dead, and they think, well, you know, obviously that didn't really happen. People don't rise from the dead. Back then, folks were very superstitious. They believed that sort of thing. But now we know better. And it is true that people in the first century probably did have a more supernatural worldview than the average American today does. But the problem with this line of reasoning is that no people group, superstitious or not, thinks that dead people come back to life. The reason for that is it's observable. You don't need the scientific method to realize dead people stay dead. Dead people stay dead. Everyone knows that. So this is really important. The evidence that the early followers of Jesus received that caused them to believe that Jesus, in fact, rose from the dead, would have convinced you also that Jesus rose from the dead. Whatever it would take for you to think a person died and then he came back alive, that's what they got. They got sufficient evidence to change their mind and believe that at this point, this one person did, in fact, Come back to life. If you saw and experienced what they saw and experienced, then you would have responded the way that they did by realizing that Jesus had actually risen from the dead. And this fact is central to the message of his followers as we read through the book of Acts, that God rose Jesus from the dead, proving that he is in fact who he claimed to be, the long-awaited Messiah sent by God to usher in the kingdom of God. It's actually what it says that Jesus taught them. Reread verse 3 again, and we'll read a little bit more. It says, He presented himself alive to them after his suffering, after his crucifixion, by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. So that was the subject that he was teaching over those 40 days. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me, For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom 
to Israel. So notice in verse three, Jesus is teaching his followers over the course of 40 days. Uh, after his resurrection, it says he's speaking about the kingdom of God. And then in verse six, their question to him is whether or not Jesus will fully and finally restore the kingdom of God in Israel, which might indicate they have a little bit of a misunderstanding because God's intentions were never to actually simply restore the nation of Israel to glory, but instead spread his kingdom over the earth. So this idea of the kingdom of God is a storyline that runs pretty much through the whole of Scripture. It's the thing that God's been doing with the world that he created. The kingdom of God is the place where God's good reign and rule exist. So from the very beginning, even in the creation narrative, the Bible teaches that everything was as it should be. It's something the Bible describes in Hebrew as shalom. It's a word that translates peace, but it's more than that. It's completeness or wholeness. Theologian Cornelius Plantiga says that shalom is where everything is as it should be. So imagine a life where every need is supplied for. No anxiety or fear or uncertainty about the future. No relational conflict or disunity. No gnawing sense of insecurity or competition with others. This is what the Bible means when it says that our first parents were, quote, naked and unashamed. This is a place of acceptance and approval and love by God and each other. No rebellion against God causing ruin and chaos. No oppression, no war, no injustice, no lying or cheating or stealing. No disregard for the lives of others. No sickness, no disease, no death. A state where humanity and creation itself thrived just as God made them and with the God who made them. This is the idea of the kingdom of God. And of course, you know the story. Our first grandparents defected from God's kingdom. They sought to create their own kingdoms. They distrusted God. They decided for themselves right and wrong. And that rebellion, what the Bible calls sin, fragments the created order. It breaks shalom, bringing with it everything that we lament around us, all the conflict, violence, greed, pain, sorrow, and more, because it separates us from God and it breaks apart our relationships with each other and with God's good creation. And so this then becomes a central plot line of the Bible. What is God going to do about this? We have a problem. What's God going to do? And the answer is Jesus. From the second Jesus steps on the scene, his message is, the kingdom of God is at hand, so you should repent and believe the good news. That's his message. Jesus didn't come with a plan for self-improvement or a religious pattern of life that would force God to accept us. He came bringing news, what the, gospel, what the Greeks called gospel, means good news, that Jesus has done what we could not do for ourselves through his life, death, and resurrection. The kingdom of God is at hand, that sin and death are now defeated enemies, and there's an end of guilt and shame and conflict and that oppression, disease, dysfunction, pain, and brokenness will not have the last word. And in Christ, eternal, full, abundant, restored life is on the horizon. This is the work that Jesus came to do. It's what he has done. It's what's available to us. And so Jesus is spending these 40 days proving to them that his resurrected life uh, that, he, that he is, he's come back to life, resurrected. He's teaching them about the kingdom of God. These are all the dots that Jesus is connecting for them. So it makes sense that the disciples and then in verse six would say, okay, so is now the time that you're gonna do all that? Are you gonna, are you gonna finally restore the kingdom of God now? You can, you can understand maybe there'd be some anticipation and excitement in their question, but look how Jesus responds. Verse seven, he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. It could be a personality flaw but I cannot read this without seeing some humor in it. Can you imagine your whole life you grow up hearing about this promised Messiah? Your people have waited hundreds of years 
for God to fully, finally restore his kingdom. This Messiah is going to make right everything that's wrong. You meet Jesus. He claims to be that Messiah. You follow him. You see miracles. You see him be popular. You see him be rejected. You see him killed, and you think your hopes are gone. Then he rises from the dead, and he proves that he's the Messiah. And you're with Jesus again, and he's teaching about his kingdom. And you ask, okay, Jesus, this has been quite the roller coaster. The ups and downs, whoo, but you've finally defeated sin and death. You've proven that you're the long-awaited Messiah. It's been years of waiting for you to establish your reign. Is it finally time? I mean, how does it work? Do you snap your fingers? or how, I don't know how this works, but is it, is it go time? And Jesus says, I'm not telling. <laughs> but I do have a plan to spread my kingdom to the ends of the earth. And the plan is you. And then he just floats up. (laughs) And they're standing there like, (laughs) did did he just say we're the plan? (laughs) If I'm there, I'm thinking, Jesus, you're going to need a better plan. We just abandoned you <laughs> just now. Just, you want to do some strategy session? I'll get a whiteboard. Surely, surely we can come up with something better here. Has there ever been a larger assignment given to a more unqualified group of people? I mean, former tax collectors and religious zealots and fishermen. This is, this is the B team. And Jesus says, you're the plan. And in fact, verse 8 is, uh, in my opinion, it's the thematic statement for the entire book of Acts. When Jesus says, you will be my witnesses. You're going to be powered, filled, fueled by my spirit. And you're going to go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. That's what the book of Acts is about. And that word witness In Greek is the word martus. It's actually where we get our word martyr from. But before it's associated with martyrdom, it described a person who would provide a testimony, like a witness in a courtroom. Almost all of the people that Jesus is speaking to got killed for their testimony. So the word became associated with martyr. It's what we now think of as martyr, which is another great evidence and proof to me of the validity of what they're saying. These people would have known if they were lying. And no one tells a lie to make their life worse. You tell a lie because you think it will be to your advantage as opposed to the truth. If the truth is to your advantage, you tell the truth. No one dies for what they know is a lie, and yet almost all of these people here did. So this idea of witness becomes one of the primary ways that Acts talks about who the church is and what the church does, that we are witnesses to the inbreaking kingdom of God. So Jesus tells them they're going to take the news of his life, death, and resurrection, the kingdom of God. They're going to go to the ends of the earth with it. Verse 10, And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, so that's present tense, mind you, behold, two men stood by them in white robes, and said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? Because he, he's, dis, he's disappearing through the clouds. Why would we not be watching someone flow? I, this is so funny to me. <laughs> this Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. So they, they say, just like Jesus left, he's coming back again. And until then, there's work to do. You'll be filled with power, and you'll be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. God's intentions are to advance his kingdom through his people by the power of his spirit. And you know what happened. What happened is exactly what Jesus said was going to happen. That's what happened. Jesus' spirit-empowered followers were his witnesses. They proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God in word and deed, and it happened just like Jesus said it would happen. You and I are the ends of the earth to these people. We are the end of the earth, and we're here. 
It went down exactly like Jesus said it would go down. So when they heard Jesus's plan, they might have doubted. You and I cannot doubt. We are the proof. You're looking at it. It happened. God has and continues to advance his kingdom through his people by the power of his spirit. What started in Acts continues to happen to this day. And so here we are, one church in a long line of churches participating in the mission of God to spread his shalom wherever we go, being ministers of reconciliation, kingdom ambassadors. We're a small part of something much bigger that God has been doing in all the corners of the globe for centuries. It's just our turn. It's our turn. So this is what our church has always been about. When we started our family of churches in 2007, this was what we wanted to see. We wanted to see more of the kingdom of God in Colombia. And back then, we didn't articulate it all that well, and we wouldn't have had maybe some of the vernacular that we have now, but the fundamentals have not changed. We've wanted to see people come to faith in Jesus, to find forgiveness and acceptance and freedom from guilt and shame and find life, like real, abundant, eternal life in Christ. And we have. We wanted to see a community of people that actually put into practice the things that Jesus said, not people who sort of tip the cap to him, but people who take it seriously, whose lives are known for love and grace and mercy and service. And we wanted to see healing of marriages and relationships and pasts and and broken situations redeemed and restored because of who God is and what he's done for us in Christ. One of my favorite examples of this, if you ever participated in a recovery cycle, you know that at the end, people talk about who they are in Christ in contrast to who they saw themselves being when they first began. It's one of the most beautiful nights, these stories of life change as people talk about what Jesus has done for them. And I, and I think this is where I won't have to sell you at all. For as much amazing fruit as we've seen through the years, It feels like now there's as much work to do as ever, maybe even maybe even more work. I don't I don't think I need to sell anyone on this. I know for me, I could use a lot more of the kingdom in my life. More patience, peace, kindness, more truth, a lot less lies, more courage, more steadfastness, more perseverance, more wisdom, more joy. You don't have to look hard at our country to come to the conclusion that in some ways it's a mess right now and that people are hurting and we've got a mental health crisis that we're in the middle of, even though people keep saying it's on the horizon, it's not, we're in the middle of it. And I just, I know that my neighborhood needs more of the kingdom of God. And I'm guessing that yours does too, that your social circle needs more of the kingdom, that your workplace needs more of the kingdom, that your family needs more of the kingdom. There's just so much yet to be made whole, so much yet to be healed, so much yet to be brought to the light, burdens that we're carrying that are meant to be handed to Jesus. And God's intention is the same today as it's always been, to advance his kingdom through his people by the power of his spirit. And so look at the end of the section that we'll study today. Look at how they responded. When Jesus tells them they're going to be his witnesses, they're going to be filled with his spirit. Verse 12 says they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the zealot and Judas the son of James. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. So their first response to being given this mission is to pray. Okay, well, technically their first response was staring in the sky. And then after that, they prayed. So Jesus says, you are my witnesses. God will advance the kingdom through you by the power of my spirit. And so they prayed. So, As a church, we try to be um, as uncreative as we can be. And if we see things in the Bible that people did, we just try to do those and not come up with new things. 
And so we thought it might be good for us to follow their example. And we're going to begin this year with 21 days of prayer and fasting. So we're starting 2022. We're just going to go to God and ask him to move, ask for his kingdom to come in our hearts and in our church and in our city and in our world. And we're asking everybody at least once per week to pick a day to fast where we don't eat uh, sun up to sundown. And we're going to not do life groups the way that we normally do them. And this is a big shift because I don't, I don't think we've ever done anything like this where we're intentionally saying, don't meet with your life group. And for three weeks, instead of our normal life group meetings in homes, our groups are going to come together corporately. And we're going to spend some time praying together corporately. My suggestion would be that you might choose that day to fast. So whatever day your group normally meets, that night your group is actually coming to, to corporately pray and come together. You can get a whole rundown of, of, of all of our plan on acts21days.com, all the information that you would need right there. Um, but we're just trying to push in and follow the example of the early followers of Jesus, asking God to bring his kingdom and praying the way that they came together to pray. And so uh, even as part of that, we're going to add some extra time in our time of response after sermons uh, to incorporate more intentional prayer on Sundays. And so as we respond, even right now, we're going to take communion. We're going to sing. We're also going to give a little bit more space for us to pray. I invite, I don't demand, but I invite that you pray with someone else in the room. Maybe someone you came with, maybe a very friendly stranger nearby. If that is not comfortable to you, that's totally fine. No pressure. We're even going to have people that are up front, right in front of the stage, if you'd like for one of them to pray for you, if you have something specific that you'd love some prayer for. We just want to do that. So we're going to have some open space to take communion, to sing, and to pray together. So the band's going to come back up and give us just a little bit of background music. Uh, we're beginning 2022 with an intentional emphasis on prayer, asking God for his kingdom to come in Colombia as it is in heaven. So let's, let's respond. Let's follow the example of the early followers of Jesus, knowing that we are God's witnesses, filled with his spirit. Let's ask him to do the work that only he can do. So let me pray for us, and then I'll set you free to have some time to respond.